On behalf of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, I would like to express our deep sadness at the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We are intensely proud of our Royal Charter, which underpins our purpose as a professional body for dispute resolution. To show our respect during this period of national mourning, I invite you to join me in one minute silence. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the fifth in the series, Acute Dispute and Underlying Conflict, co-hosted by JAMS and the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Please note this seminar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube in a couple of weeks. For many, Queen Elizabeth II represented dedication and stability, particularly in the face of adversity. In acute situations of escalation and dispute, there is often much to do, quick decisions to be made, and a sense of being overwhelmed. All of this means that we suspend concerns and second guessing and rely on instinct to make quick decisions. Logical responses given the lack of time and capacity. However, some or all of the factors and dynamics which make up an acute crisis don't just disappear, instead they endure. The interactions and domino effects of war, global public health emergencies and climate crisis are here to stay and uh, just being in crisis mode is not enough. We're being forced to somehow find the strength and time both to deal with the cycle of crises whilst also managing long-term situations which demand long-term thinking and reflection. So in the fifth of this series entitled When Acute Becomes Chronic, we step back and review the current situation in light of events since the 6th of April, the first in the series, and ask what practical suggestions and advice we can draw from the series so far for those trying to maintain some sort of commercial stability in a world of conflict. My name is Isabel Phillips, and I'm the Director of ADR and Mediation Development at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. My practice has straddled the commercial and political conflict specialist and mediator, both in commercial and fragile and post-conflict environments. I'm co-moderator of this webinar together with Nikki Borofsky of JAMS. So briefly about the format of the webinar, the webinar will be one hour, 15 minutes long. We'll have, after this short introduction, we'll have thoughts from our speakers followed by discussion and a Q&A. So please add questions in the Q&A tool at any point and use the chat function for general discussion. And if you by chance have any technical problems, please do flag them there. So um, I'd like to introduce our speakers um, now and I invite them to come on camera um, so I may do so. So Sheila Bates um, is based in France. She's a highly experienced CEDA accredited mediator, board member and trainer, as well as a conflict coach and facilitator. Her background in FTSE and Fortune quoted companies and IFIs um, is complemented by a particular interest and expertise in international disputes relating to human rights, labor law, and facilitating dialogue in supply chain management 
um, and also in relation to modern day slavery within the supply chain. Michael McElrath is based in Italy, um, has 22 years in a in lead in-house litigation roles for General Electric Oil and Gas Division, and um, was also VP of litigation for Baker Hughes. In 2021, he founded um, Disputes SRL um, and has been chair of the ICC's governing body for DR services and an adjunct professor for Bocconi Law School in Milan. He's also author of two textbooks for IDR and contract negotiation and arbitral women have recognized him as a champion of change. Our speakers are joined by my co-moderator, Nikki Borowski, who is Senior Global Practice Manager at JAMS Local Solutions. She's an attorney, mediator, and promoter of creative, thoughtful dispute resolution processes. Prior to her role as Senior Global Practice Manager, she was a VP at the CPR Institute. She's worked in-house at Alstom, as well as in the international arbitration practices at Latham and Watkins and Proskauer in Paris, France. And uh, with that, I'm going to um, hand over to Nikki um, and invite um, uh, Katrina, our wizard behind the scenes, to uh, bring up the first poll. Over to you, Nikki. Thank you so much, Isabel. And uh, thank you uh, again for this wonderful collaboration with the Chartered Institute. I'm going to uh, share some slides now and just start with a little overview of what has come to, to pass that led us to um, this fifth installment of the webinar series. Um, and as Isabel mentioned, this is entitled When Acute Becomes Chronic, and we really are uh, delving into uh, the learnings that we have accumulated and, um, and shared throughout the previous four webinars and have a nice opportunity for a bookend to, to reflect on what has been said and uh, pose uh, some continuing questions. Um, we're very lucky to have Michael and Sheila back. They're very busy and, and we both really appreciate their, their being present. Um, just as a, as a kind of historical note, uh, the reason why JAMS is involved with this is a big thanks to my former colleague, Ronce Howell, who was the former director of the global team. And he uh, and I now am a member of our business disruption working group. Um, that started when we came together uh, at the onset of the pandemic, as we saw that they're going to need to be more innovative, quick, tailored solutions to the changing crises that were happening all over the world. Um, and we really wanted to be a, a leader in, uh, in, in what was going on and ask some structured questions about how conflict resolution and dispute resolution were going to occur in times of increased crisis and uncertainty. Um, so the, the, the overarching themes are um, supply chain uh, disruption, supply web disruption, actually. It's more complex than just a chain. Uh, conflicts between contracts, uh, stress relationships, uh, both personal and business, regulatory infractions, business risk, and, and all kinds of societal upheaval, um, you know, just as we're all very saddened by the, the passing of, of the queen uh, this week. Um, I'm not gonna go over what we discussed, but I encourage everybody to check out the lovely YouTube links uh, for the first four sessions. Um, there's a lot of great uh, engagement and information there and uh, CIRB has posted them for your access. Having guest speakers speaking from their perspectives, from a corporate, from um, public, from international, around the world. And in addition, um, the webinars represent the input and questions of thousands of virtual audience members, just like yourself. So I hope you continue in the tradition of using the Q&A function and engaging and asking uh, questions. Really what we're doing today is, uh, is delivering on our promise to listen, acknowledge, learn, and respond, um, and use the, the information that's been generated by to, to continue the learning. And uh, Katrina, I think if we could launch the next poll right now, we can get another kind of a data point on where all of you are coming from and your background and experience. Um, we're really, looking into what's happening, uh, particularly at JAMS, 
we're seeing how how accurate were we in predicting uh, what we thought would happen? How are conflicts being settled? How are we adapting? Are the dispute resolution tools being used? Are providers and practitioners, are we responsible? Responding as anticipated? Are there force majeure uh, battles? Uh, are we seeing an increase in emergency arbitrations, expedited procedures, tailored early interim solutions? How are we doing with hybrid? How are we doing with virtual and online and remote processes? Um, and how is the impact of deep into motion in these acute times uh, intermixing and intermingling with all these processes? Um, you know, how is the legal landscape evolving with new instruments like the Singapore Convention? Um, this is all kind of to be determined but we're happy to, to be delving forward and, and, um, and understanding it. Today's objective is really to welcome Sheila and Michael back to review what's happened, uh, see if they were correct in their predictions, and they've had uh, a wonderful and a wonderful job of homework of watching all of the previous webinars and really identifying some of the themes that are, are running throughout. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Michael and Sheila for your interventions. Thank you so much. Or back to Isabel probably to, to introduce, I think. Um, well, just really to, to hand to Sheila to, to kick us off with this um, uh, fascinating uh, discussion. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. Um, great to be back here again. So. Yes, I've had a, a lovely time reviewing um, everything that's been discussed in the last um, four uh, uh, webinars. And I thought today that it would be useful to frame them in the context of, of what mediators often do is to look at disputes from the perspective of the, the legal concerns, the commercial concerns, um, relationships, technology, and sustainability. So that was kind of the framework through which I wanted to, to look at things. And um, one of the things that, there, there were several themes that came out across um, all the, the, the webinars. And Michael and I started off at the, the, at the beginning talking about um, uh, how um, the, dis, the, the disruption uh, as a result of, of what was happening in Ukraine Ukraine of us coming out of COVID was impacting business and, and dispute resolution and the issues um, identified. And I think um, Mike is going to talk in depth about energy um, because that's had such a massive impact. Um, we also looked at things um, like, um, you know, uh, we spoke about talent and would there be enough manpower? And that certainly proved to be something which has been such an area of key concern. Um, sitting um, in uh, in the UK for part of my time, I thought that perhaps that was just because it was the UK and Brexit. But in fact, um, through research that I've done and just in all my, my context, um, context uh, across the globe, I've identified that that there is really a lack of, of, of resource and skill to to work in so many so many areas at the moment, which is frustrating the situation. Supply chains have certainly been disrupted massively. Um, and in fact, um, you know, I'm using the word supply chain, and of course, absolutely, it's a supply web um, because it's very complex um, and that has all sorts of ramifications. I'm going to give an example of that a bit later on. So, um, and I think the the title of this conference is when acute becomes chronic, and in fact. What we've seen is that what started in 2020, it's just been a continuum. And so it's really about how we prepare ourselves um, to, to deal with these ongoing crises. And there were sort of four areas um, that I thought were, were interesting. And the first was acting in a crisis. Um, it seems to be we have one series of crises after, after another. And I thought the interesting thing listening to the to the uh, previous webinars was this sort of juxtaposition between the legal processes, the various mechanisms available to people to to manage disputes and things that have gone wrong, very practically speaking, like ships not being able to dock and uh, people not being able to affect payments because uh, money got stuck in bank accounts in the wrong country and all these very sort of practical things. Um, and the reality of the context on the ground. And I think in looking at disputes, um, another key thing that's come out of this series is that context is pretty much everything. Um, and so 
the notion of speed, and we spoke quite a bit about that, and it was across the whole series, in a crisis, you know, we talk about uh, democracy moves slowly, um, but in a crisis, you need to move fast. And if you think about that in terms of, for example, law, you can say that that moves slowly, whereas you need to move fast. Um, and in business continuity, um, that actually is a process that's, that's designed to, to be running along so that when the, when the urgency comes, when the crisis happens, so that you can respond. So I think that how are you practically speaking going to handle things on the ground? And I think that there, there was really, um, you know, speed is necessary. Uh, we need to be flexible. Um, you can't wait a year and a half for something to get to court and be resolved because there's people's livelihoods at stake. Um, and this has become very acute in a way that we might not have expected six months ago um, in terms of, for example, um, uh, food security, which is something that um, in many countries of the world you see as belonging to countries that are actually quite far away from you. Whereas the reality of climate change, energy crisis um, has meant that actually water and food security are becoming an issue which many people are very skilled um, at dealing with. But hey ho, some of us in the old countries are actually having to wake up and get their act together on this. So we've got a lot to learn from, from many other countries. So I found that, that particularly interesting. Um, also the issue of enforcement, how the heck do you enforce stuff um, in war, um, when communication is blocked, when people haven't got water? I mean, hey ho, there may be lovely processes, but how are you gonna deal with that life-threatening crisis on, on, on the ground? Um, and very often if the courts aren't there, um, you know, there isn't a process to enforce. And uh, it was interesting to see that one of the speakers um, spoke very much about the fact that mediation in Asia perhaps because of the Singapore Convention was being, there's been a big uptake in, in working with mediation because it is more flexible um, and less heavy, let's say, than some of the other um, dispute resolution processes, which, which may be available. And another really important thing about it is uh, a giving voice. And I think that that was something that's come up as a theme is that at the end of the day, who are your stakeholders? Um, um, people on the ground, and again, this has become very, um, I think we've all become much more aware of this, that what's going on in the world is impacting everybody um, from the top of the corporation right down to individuals on the ground who actually can now no longer buy their favorite pasta. OK, they can buy something else. That's great. Um, on the other hand, there are people who's really who, who's who's life is really being impacted by these shortages. And I think it's something that we're going to experience in, in, in Western Europe in a way that we haven't seen probably since the last war. Um, so I think that how do you resolve in the here and now um, and what are the practical things that you, you, can, you can use? Um, and I think out of that has come um, really a sense of, you know, use what works. Um, you're in a crisis. Um, I remember years ago working with uh, when I worked at, at um, uh, in the financial sector many years ago when we had a CEO who was a French guy and he had a very very heavy French accent when he spoke English but he used to say it is important and it is urgent and therefore we need to take the time to do it properly and that was in a way so spot on so you've got to take in a way take the time you've got to work out is mediation, arbitration, mediation mix gonna work? Do you need to have conciliation, adjudication, facilitation, mediation? And what's really come across, I would say, in, in, in a strong way is that the ability to be flexible and adapt and to use that toolkit um, and not just think um, along one process, one approach, but to borrow the skills and borrow the processes from elsewhere to come up with an amalgam that works in that situation um, is really, really vital. And, um, you know, dispute boards are something that, for example, could be incredibly useful to, to actually have a standing, a standing group. It's a bit like a lot of companies have business continuity. Of course, if you're sitting in a small SME, the chances of you having a business continuity group are pretty unlikely because guess what? Um, you're, you, you know, don't have the, the degree of, 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 of manpower available to, to, to deal with that um, or, or the funds. So one of my sort of reflections on that was actually when it comes down to being flexible and adaptable, um, 
business and particularly the private sector are actually often very good at doing that. And are we as dispute resolution providers, are we are we leading from the front? Are we accompanying them or are we walking behind with some processes and approaches that maybe are, are, are perhaps great, um, but are perhaps not so usable uh, in, in the context of, of, uh, of conflict and, and crisis? So I think that that using what works and, and okay, there's the, the, the case of enforcement. And I think it's very interesting to work that perhaps why mediation is helpful is that um, in the case of mediation, people come together and they dialogue and they, they're facilitated by, by a mediator, by a neutral person. Um, and the objective is to reach an agreement that, that is workable um, and that works for all and where people have voice. And I think that, um, it was interesting to reflect on the, the need for, for, for the dialogue actually, um, and allowing that dialogue to take place. Um, then I think there was a very interesting thing around creating the mindset. Um, uh, at the end of the day, you, you know, we see the acute scenario becoming chronic. Uh, my goodness me, I was reflecting back on 9-11. Uh, so it was, you know, it was yesterday we remembered again that terrible atrocity um, and thinking actually I was living in Belgium at the time I was working on putting together a, um, a new brand and we'd been acquired by a different telecommunications operator I was working for a big telecommunication telecommunications brand at the time and we were working on doing this and we had done some market research because we had to create this new brand and one of the things that was very evident from the research was that there was a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt running around. Uh, this was 2001. And whilst we were in a caucus working on this, uh, this particular, uh, you know, what this brand should look like, what might the values be and so forth, up pops on the television screen, this atrocity happening in the US. And in fact, we were already in an area of fear and uncertainty of doubt. And we all know that 9-11 only overlaid a hell of a lot more. Um, what seems to have happened since then is that the series of crises seems to have sped up. Um, I think, you know, the fear and certainty doubt at that time was the dot-com crisis. We just had, uh, you know, the, the, the turn of the millennium, et cetera. And we fast forward to where we are today and we think, my goodness me, all the crises that we seem to be, you know, it, it, they just seem to be coming faster and thicker than, than, than in the past. And maybe that's down to, to globalization. So, Really, um, what's important is to have a mindset that is, you will never have all the answers. That's not the point. The point is to have a mindset that says, okay, what's the situation that I'm in now? What is it? You know, what can I do about it? Um, what sort of processes and frameworks do I have that are relevant? And what is not currently relevant? What is, what's that looking like? And what workarounds can we have? And I think one of the very interesting things that came up from Jane Gunn, who was talking in, in one of the seminars, was actually thinking deeply um, and actually taking the time again to really think deeply, to, to, you know, to have a mindset and consciousness that we're living in a world of flux um, and, you know, expect the unexpected, whatever that is. Um, and I think this is not a new theme. I think remember in my, you know, even 30 years ago when business continuity was first coming into play, people were talking about that and I was involved in those committees and stuff. But here we are in the here and now and it's happening so more. So that kind of continual um, optimization adaptation is, is really, really important. And you need to analyze what's going on. And very often people don't take that time um and you know it's what we say in mediation you know go slow to go fast and so often if you take the time to analyze what's going on actually think deeply about those conversations and the difficult decisions you will have to make because guess what um very often the situation is not going to be great you're just going to have to work with the best you can so it's optimizing the situation that you're in and i think recognizing that and having the courage to take difficult decisions really is very much facilitated if you take the time take some time out spend those two or three hours guess what that will buy you um and have the have the dialogue um 
I think it's it's really interesting too to to think about thinking dangerously. You know, we don't want to go there. You know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. But actually, guess what? It's going on around us, and I think that denial. Um, phase is something that perhaps we need to get over a bit a, a bit quicker and actually have the courage to face into those those conversations. What I found particularly interesting was that in some of the perhaps um, heavier processes, I might explain them, um, which are perhaps more procedural than something like mediation, was often the conversation was, guess what? We need to deal even those in those commercial scenarios with the heavier legal frameworks. We need to deal with the relationship. And at the end of the day, everybody is, in a way, nobody's neutral. We've all got all this unconscious bias, you know, cognitive biases. We've got our context and what matters to us. Um, and it's, it's really recognizing that we may have to come together to work with people that we don't particularly like. Um, you have to face who you may perceive as the enemy um, and you have to work with them. And in fact, finding points of interest um, and common areas of interest or areas that are more or less important to the other can be helpful to 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 reach you know a, a way forward is is actually to to recognize um, that we're all sentient beings um, and that at the end of the day if you can make that human connection and just be aware of what's going on for everybody else in the room and taking that time to to really prepare what's going on for me, what's going on for them, what are my interests, what are their interests, and to to really taking that 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 you know that step forward is incredibly important. Um, and I think really it it brings me on to in a way if you look at the psychological impact of everything that's gone on, fear, uncertainty, doubt, I mean a real fear of of, of death, um, a real fear of lack of water, a real fear of are the crops going to, you know, come in? Which is something that that you know has been more or less a common theme for in certain areas, and less of a theme in the past. So, hence why I think we have a, a lot to to learn from people around the world and collaborate from their experiences. But I think this long term uh, dealing with these issues is very fatiguing, and um, you know they often talk about if people are poor or, or that that. Uh, and, and in a difficult situation, often the decisions made are poor. So it's what is our decision process making like when we've been dealing with this continuum of, 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 of difficulties and, and crises? And I think it's about understanding that and just recognizing um, those, those emotions. Um, recall in 2008 when we had that big financial crash. And uh, at the time I was working um, at the EBRD, which is the um, you know, is a development bank. And the president at that time was a guy called Thomas Miro. He was he's a very smart guy. And I remember him saying, well, we need to really be careful about social unrest because what's happened as a result of this financial crisis is social unrest. And once again, fast forward to where we are today and you see that all of that has just been amplified. And I think that he was quite forward looking in that. Um, so I think that it's it's important also to recognize the stresses and the strains that we're under over time. So just going to really wrap up um, and in a way hand over to, to, to Michael and the others in terms of, you know, what's happened in terms of Ukraine and the geopolitical environment that we're living in. Um, what's happened on the climate change here in Europe? My goodness, it's been it's been something else this year. Um, and what's going on with energy and to actually look at those uh, those those situations um, in terms of where we are relative to where we were at the beginning of this uh, of this um, crisis, as it were. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Really fascinating um, review of, of some of the things that have been mentioned um, and some of the topics that, and, and areas that have come up across the series. Um, just before we move to Michael, I'm going to um, ask um, Katrina to just show us the results of the poll of, of um, so we know a little bit more about who we're talking to, um, because we put up a poll right at the beginning. So you see we've got a good number of people in various types of ADR services, uh, legal services, um, and across uh, a whole range of different areas from public sector to um, industry and academia. So thank you for participating in that poll. Um, <clears throat> We'll be um, asking you two more 
poll questions uh, in, in due course. Um, uh, the second one will uh, come up in a few minutes, but I'll, I'll hand over to Michael at this point. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. And thank you uh, for the, uh, the setting me up very well, Sheila, for what I wish to, to discuss here today, um, returning. Um, I, at the risk of, um, of sharing with you, well, you know, kind of what I did over my summer holiday, um, it, it is a, I'd like to say that I actually, you know, um, as a result of having engaged in the earlier conversation that we had in the initial seminar, uh, we took on ourselves to actually organize something uh, that we held um, a few weeks after our seminar, which was a convening of um, stakeholders in energy projects to, to do exactly, um, actually it struck me as well, what Jane Gunn had said, Sheila, that you know, to, to reflect, to think deeply about what, what it is that we're facing in terms of challenges and how might we be able to think about doing things differently in order to, to address them. Um, and what, so I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And then I'll, if I have time, I'll mention a little, uh, I think what I think is another acute um, dispute that's becoming chronic that we're facing, and that is disputes arising from climate change. But I'll talk just briefly here about energy infrastructure. Um, and what we did is, and, and if, Katrina, if you want to just put up the um, the charts, I'll, I'll share some background. Um, and, and I did want to point, I see that, and we have, by the way, a wonderful, because we're talking about different stakeholders in the process, it was great to see such a wide range of, of you know, different professionals that we have today who are, who are present. Um, you know, from arbitration community to, to mediation. And by the way, in terms of the arbitration, I noticed we have Dana McGrath, who's the former president of Arbitral Women. I just want to make sure that my Arbitral Women pin is sufficiently visible on camera. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, but it's great to have such a broad, a broad group um, today. Um, what, what we had uh, is here in Italy. And again, I apologize for this being focused on Italy, but I think it's the sort of situation that you would find is easily being, well, easily, it's being faced in every country. And it's something that is replicable in, in anywhere as to face challenges. And what, what we did with the help of the, um, the, of the Chamber of Commerce um, and with the United States ambassador, um, the acting ambassador to Italy, Thomas Smitham, and his Council for Economic Affairs is that we convened a lot of major um, industry players in Italy, um, CEOs, um, business leaders of Ita Italy energy and some in construction businesses. There are quite a few here in Italy. We had several represented. It was a, a total of about 20 people who gathered together, some sales leaders from, from both construction, both from fossil fuels and renewables industries. And we had some company council who were involved in negotiating infrastructure projects. And you know, we're here today, we're dispute professionals. And I think to Sheila's point about, you know, how as we engage in these conversations, you know, why are, why are we there? Why are we talking about how we look at these problems? Well, because we're part of the process. We need to be driving as much as possible and have a seat at the table when these discussions take place, even though they're not exclusively focused on dispute resolution, but dispute resolution is one component of getting things done, or make, at least making sure that one of the obstacles or some of the obstacles are removed in order for progress to be made. So we, we also had very importantly at this, we had a representative of, of the Italian government, the Ministry of Economic Development um, and the energy sector. This, was, this turned out to be actually quite critical to the discussion. We can move forward, Katrina. Um, the, the group identified a, um, a number of impediments that we were facing as, you know, in, in light of the situation. I think some of the not, some of these are, are not going to be unfamiliar to many people, but these were, I would say, acute impediments that we were facing at the moment. The uncertainty and delays of government permits, which is a, which is a, a has, has been for many years a chronic problem already in Italy. Um, the problem, as Sheila mentioned, scarcity of raw materials and skilled labor, and the pricing volatility that made contracting difficult. Um, contract models that discouraged um, collaboration. You know, things, for example, fixed price, it tends to be a zero sum game, um, you know, and it also tended to discourage rapid execution. Um, and we also, of course, in our sector being dispute resolution, we noticed that project disputes um, didn't accelerate projects, they tended to delay them. So these were the, I'd say, the four areas of impediments that this group jointly together said, these are the things that if we're going to um, go forward and want to move more quickly in building infrastructure, we need to face into them. 
in, in terms of solutions, and I'd like to share with you, I think are some very practical guidance and considerations that the group came up with. Um, Katrina, if we can turn uh, to the next page, we divide them into um, solutions relating to government, the public sector. And, and this, by the way, is something that I think one of the other seminars touched on, on the one on civil law and common law and international contracts, just discussing the increasing importance of the convergence of the public sector, um, where you really have many different cultures. You have the common law, you have the civil law, but you also have a public sector culture, which often brings its own culture to the table. And there's a you need to navigate the convergence of these different approaches when you're working on, on large projects. Um, we, um, we the, the group felt, again, this was very collaborative, and the idea was not to point fingers at any one stakeholder, but to come up with what are ways that we can approach this to work together. Um, Italy actually felt that, that, that we have here in this country a model for where you can go fast on major infrastructure projects. And it was, it's, it, it, it's, it's called the Ponte Morandi, the, the Genova Bridge. Um, it was this terrible collapse of a bridge that, that, a tra a traver uh, that, that traverses Genova. Um, lives were lost. It was a horrible, horrible tragedy. Um, but it was also a, an important artery for Italian uh, road transportation. And it was rebuilt in record time. Um, and it was built safely and built well with good engineering practices because there was a, a high level of collaboration between uh, the private sector and the government. Um, uh, the other area that, that, that we felt need and could be addressed was you know, discussing with government, the government just being more rapid to authorize projects to move forward. For example, if you've got land that's zoned or might be used to develop an energy infrastructure project, whether it might be, let's say, an LNG terminal, as a, which might be a large project, or perhaps just smaller projects for connecting infrastructure and making sure things work together, that the, law, the lost time of six months, a year, two years, while parties wait for governments to issue permits is something that really ought to be addressed by governments. Um, the, um, we, we, we also felt, and again, this was something that the, the representatives, these were very senior representatives of the private sector said, is that there needs to be receptivity to dialogue, that rather than just you know, having a combative adversarial approach to the government, you either give us this or I don't or I sue, that perhaps there ought to be more dialogue taking place and that the private sector ought to be willing to engage in that sort of dialogue. Similarly, and again, this was also something that was touched upon in some of the earlier seminars, you know, the interaction between the public sector and the communities that might be impacted and how greater transparency um, would, would be helpful um, to, um, to, to discuss and also deal with potential impacts of projects. And then we also discussed, I'll get it here, but you know, maybe the use of economic development zones as a way of also providing some transparency around these issues. And then we dealt with the private sector. And here's where I think you will see that many of you will find that whether you're a, an ADR in arbitration or mediation or other dispute professional, or just somebody who's advising businesses, Katrina, the, the, the next chart, you'll see that, that there are inputs that we can provide as we participate um, with, our, with our business colleagues. Um, and that is around, I think, we, and this is what the group really felt. And I was, I was struck that this didn't come from the lawyers as much as it came from the business people who said that they felt that there needed to be a cultural shift um, across the sector away from pure uh, risk and price allocation from one side to the other, and more towards you know risk sharing and collaboration. They said, if we want to go fast, um, we're going to need to get comfortable. We're not there now, but we need to get comfortable ar around how do we you know collaborate in a way that we can actually share risk rather than allocate it at the beginning. What does that mean? Well, that means that maybe we don't do turnkey or fixed price contracts. Maybe we find other you know, uh, models such as cost plus or index anchoring ways of anchoring certain materials requirements or labor requirements in a contract, which would allow one of the contracting parties to say, well, I, I can start now. I don't know what my prices are going to be, but I can give you a price today. And if the price goes up, we'll find a way to allocate that later. Um, we did spend, actually, you won't be surprised, a, a fair amount of time also discussing dispute resolution. And I have not seen in my career a lot of use of dispute boards in the energy sector 
And I was very surprised to see the business people when this subject was raised. Well, what about standing committees or dispute boards? Is this something that would help you to keep projects on track? Um, we found a high level of receptivity to, to that. And it was like, oh, well, that's a really interesting thing. Maybe we should explore that. I've never heard of that before. Um, so again, if you're a, a dispute professional and you're advising the clients and participating, you might find actually today that there's more receptivity on the business side to, to these, what, what for them would be you know, novel um, approaches or innovative means of resolving disputes. Um, and then again, there was also some discussion about are there ways that the Italian industry might be able to cooperate better in terms of procuring um, better raw materials and labor. Um, so those were just some core concepts that I would say that in terms of us being part of promoting a cultural shift, I think that these are things that we could take on board no matter where we are in the dispute resolution area, whether it is at, you know, in terms of mediation and advising our clients to perhaps adopt more mediation clauses that we might include in our contracts, or even arbitrators who might be thinking of, are there ways of us, as we talked in the first seminar, ways of perhaps accelerating proceedings or perhaps holding a second case management conference to decide some issues up front so that the parties might be able to settle out earlier on, if you can find. We, again, we touched upon that in the, in the first seminar. So those are just some of the things that I, I, I thought I'd share with you in terms of how we took forward some of what we learned from this seminar series and tried to implement it. And a and very positive, I would say, a very positive feedback that we got from business and government. And then I just I want to touch on um, just if we can Katrina move to the final um, chart, chart here on um, climate change disputes. Um, and I, I'll say that I, I think that this is just another area where we're going to see a lot of disputes or a lot of the causes of the disputes going from the acute to chronic. And as Sheila mentioned, we're already seeing this uh, around the world. I think it's ever more present. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you just a, a very public um, climate change disaster that happened to my company uh, when I was in 2006, when I was the head of litigation of GE Oil and Gas. And that was a, a flood, what you, what, what you perhaps would have called um, 50 years ago, a 250, 300 year flood, meaning a flood that happens once every 250, 300 years, uh, where the rains came down so hard that waters flowed down from the, the mountains around, this is in Southern Italy, in a town called Vibo Valencia. Um, the waters flowed down the water, overflowed the, the waterways, and they, they destroyed, um, caused untold millions and millions of damage of businesses and residences, that, and, and it caused actually a few deaths. It was a terrible flood in the area of Vibo. Um, and that um, the waterways simply weren't built to withstand, because they're not built to withstand floods every 250 or 300 years. That would require enormous investments in infrastructure that, frankly, um, the public sector doesn't make. Uh, the problem is, is that the 250 year floods seems like they might be coming every 25, 20, 15 years now. And so, you know, there, we are going to have disputes arising from businesses and, and private parties who are impacted by climate change events like this. Well, what happened in our case? In our case, the businesses all got together. Um, I actually hired some several experts and lawyers, and um, this is in 2006, um, claimed damages against the government for inadequate maintenance and failure to predict these types of, of, of events, and went to court for many years. Um, I left the company in 2021, and I think the, 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 our final hearing was somewhere perhaps one or two years before that. Um, it didn't, by the way, it didn't turn out well for the businesses. Um, some of them got compensated, many of them didn't. And I guess what I would say is that for the um, public sector to help adapt, businesses to adapt in the future um, to these types of events, we need to think differently. I mean, businesses simply can't go forward if their way of getting recompense is to sit 10, 12, 15 years in the courts, there needs to be the introduction of mechanisms that will allow for businesses to find some form of compensation or other means that they may be able to go forward as we find that these climate change events will occur with increasing frequency. And I just note that the um, ICC commission report in 2019 identified two likely areas of disputes that we're gonna see. One is the one I just mentioned earlier about energy infrastructure projects, but the other was exactly the fact the problem that we faced 
in 2006, which is damages arising from um, impact of climate change, to which I'd say that modern litigation and dispute resolution systems as they are used today are simply inadequate to, to address these types of, of situations. So on that, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude and uh, say thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Really fascinating examples there of really practical um, expressions of, of some of the dilemmas we're, we're, we're talking about here. Um, I'd just like in, in, to invite Katrina to put up the last of the polls just uh, uh, briefly, um, because you've given us interesting answers, both about which sectors you come from um, and uh, which um, ADL um, processes you, you work in. We'd now like to know specifically which roles uh, you have practical experience in these ADL processes in, because of course that is quite a, a, an interesting thing. And one or two of the questions that we've got so far relate very specifically um, uh, to that question, um, both of, of um, uh, processes, which of course relate relates to roles. Um, so just to, um, because I think I think this question relates so intricately to one or two things that have already been brought up. We've got a, a question from somebody in uh, Qatar who's asking um, about uh, situations where uh, I'm going to, to, to summarize briefly. I, I know Sheila and Michael, you can probably see the question yourselves, but there's complex situations where um, both parties can't really agree on how to deal with even the things that they're supposed to do contractually. There's government issues going on which may be blocking the use of particular processes in the background. Um, what do you do? What what tools are available? Because I think that the sketch there is actually quite a common situation, particularly given the difficulties of the current situation um, and the level of, of crisis management that governments are having to manage at the same time as uncertainty and so on and so forth. So um, over to you guys. Michael. I've actually faced a similar situation in, in, in this um, where I've had um, uh, the opportunity to raise investment claims against countries where we had felt there was a denial of, of justice, that there was just frankly, and that was available under certain investment treaties. And in the case of my company, which provided important infrastructure to countries, we were told, uh, I don't care about your 5 million or 6 million claim because our interest in future projects in the country is much greater than that. And so we didn't pursue those claims. And I, I, I hate to say, but I think that to our anonymous attendee, those are business decisions that businesses have to make. You have to be able to put on, you know, to weigh them and say, you know, as you, as you do in any commercial case, the, you know, the country or the client is, is too significant for me. I'm going to write this off. At a certain point, it becomes so expensive that maybe you won't do business with that customer in the future. And maybe you won't do business in, 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 in that country, in which case maybe you will take them to court when they won't adopt to other measures. But I do think embedded in this question is a very important point. And that's something that all of the people who are here today, I think can contribute to. And that's no matter where you are, to the extent that you have an ability to participate and influence um, governments, you know, the public sector, those voices to adopt some form of mediation, some form of access to justice so that you're not forced into a situation. This was a constant frustration for me as a company lawyer. It's either we go to arbitration or, or we don't, or, or litigation, right? It was an either or. And, and, and the other problem you have with this is if the governments do go down that path, they have to make sure that they have implementing frameworks, structures in place so that people can negotiate in good faith. I mean, it's not easy for governments just to agree to mediation. They actually have to have the support behind that to make sure that there are checks and balances, there are things that avoid accusations of corruption because people say, you know, I'm a government employee. I settled that case. They're going to accuse me of taking a bribe, right? You need to have very serious frameworks so that people can negotiate without that fear. And a lot of work has been done to help develop these models so that governments can engage better in mediation. So I'd say use, use your influence to get those mechanisms adopted. <laughs> And I'd just like to, at, at that point, do a shout out um, for, for our next in the series, where we're going to be joined by um, a speaker called Jimena Bostamante, who's uh, worked in Ecuador um, in, in mediation processes. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because Ecuador has a fascinating shift in their legislation that allows government to settle disputes at mediation. 
uh, whereas a lot of countries actually have it written into the legislation that it's not possible, that the government is not allowed to settle. So this question of how um, the private sector and the um, uh, private, uh, the pub private and public sectors can interact and influence um, uh, to enable um, settlement of, of disputes in, in, in both sides' interest is, is quite a, uh, an interesting one. And if you're in a specific jurisdiction, it's easy to think that that's the way it is everywhere else. But actually, there's huge divergence in relation to dispute resolution practice in relation to that. Um, so I think that's a, a really important point. Um, so we can, have can, I, can I answer quickly, Isabel, just that Thomas Kelly asks yeah. I think, a very valid question is, will these ideas work in practice? And, you know, I think part of it is you can try, it's not going to hurt you to try, right, to be the person who's trying to put something forward. But I will tell you, give you feedback. I, I am aware of one of the participants in this session um, who is now using, again, not a dispute resolution practice, but a contracting practice. Again, we're dispute resolution professionals. We see the things that send people into disputes. And one that they took forward was with respect to building um, energy storage tanks where they've been deprived of a lot of access to nickel and other materials. I think we talked about this in the first time, but that's a lot of those materials are, are in the Donbass region. And so you can't get them anymore or the price, what you can get is very expensive. So what they're now doing is they said, ah, well, that's actually an interesting idea. They're now tying to, to the London Met materials index or metallurgical index um, in their contracts, which is allowing them to move more forward more quickly with some of the projects that they're undertaking in Italy. So again, just by, I, I feel good that we took that conversation and got them involved and you have people in a room talking about this. You know, sometimes they do work and, you know, that, not everything, but, you know, not, there's progress here and there is all progress. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Sheila, you yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I've unmuted myself. <laughs> uh, there had to be one. <laughs> so um, my experience um, is that often working with international organizations who on the one hand we perceive often to be very lugubrious and very heavy um, is looking at some of the work that they do around what's called policy dialogue on the ground and that how often financing um, can be linked to um, you know, certain environmental and, and, and um, um, social um, standards that need to be in place and um, that that goes on quietly in the background and that, you know, these things can take a long time. There's probably a lot of that going going on and, and perhaps what can be useful to to um, to investors and large and small, is also to check in with some of those organizations who actually um, are, you know, they actually work on influencing people, call policy dialogue, uh, interacting, you know, do you have the right um, legal frameworks in place, which is something that, that, that Michael and several other people have obviously touched on. Um, so I think that that is, is happening um, in the background, but it, it takes time. Uh, what I think is is difficult is that at a governmental level, I had a case um, that ran for about 18 months um, working in, in, in Africa where there was um, uh, a big investor uh, in, in this country, but who were absolutely perceived to be in cahoots with, with, with the government. Um, and it was very difficult to try and uh, work out, uh, A, was that true? Uh, and, and B, what, what was necessary at the root of that. Um, and that is complicated. And I suppose what's important to say is it's maybe not that straightforward. There isn't, I don't think there's necessarily just a panacea. It's not to be negative, but it's to realize that, that those, the issues of trust may often be there, um, culture, power imbalances. And so that, that, can provide can, can provide challenges and oftentimes I think that in some jurisdictions where you you think that people would be um, that that they are perhaps you know um, the law is upheld more easily that those institutions are are, are stronger surprisingly um, you can come unstuck in those also quite quite often um, I think so. Um, not an easy answer to your to your issues, um, but I think it's perhaps working with some of those people who can who can help provide influence um, for you as well. 
and I just wanted to echo that I think a lot of, of what we're trying to do with this series is really to share solutions and ideas and information across the barriers of different kinds of dispute resolution, across the public-private barrier, uh, you know, across the SME, huge multinational corporation divide, and really uh, underscore that there are lessons to be learned from all of these individuals and, and companies and entities and states who do this kind of work. Um, there have been acute crises as long as we've existed, and, and people have been thinking about innovative ways to fashion solutions. This reminds me a little bit, um, JAMS just hosted the USMCA, which is the United States, Mexico, Canada trade agreement talks, where specifically it was the advisory committee on private dispute resolution that was meeting with representatives from the government to talk about what each, what the kind of leaders in each country um, who conduct private dispute resolution processes are doing and how each of the different stakeholders and countries and the relationships and challenges that exist amongst them might be able to be addressed. Um, and, you know, as Sheila and Michael said, there's no easy solution, but uh, there is, and I think echoing some of the questions that we've seen, there is um, a, a great uh, benefit to sharing the resources um, and, and to, to having these kinds of conversations so that we can cross pollinate. And I think the Michael's example of, you know, taking the conversation that we had initially in April and actually putting it to use uh, in his in his business life, uh, you know, in his day to day consultations is, is an excellent example. And we hope that, you know, this conversation will spur similar, um, similar kind of progress. Yeah, Nikki, I, I, I agree absolutely. And just looking at, um, at, at Mohammed's uh, question um, about um, where government isn't ready to listen and, and maybe um, somewhat or very oppressive in, in nature. I think as with many questions like that, it's a very, very big question and there's lots of different answers to it um, that can, can, can be given on different levels. Um, I think one of the things that's uh, interesting in, in things like that is actually looking at how other countries deal with it. And so that comes back a little bit to your point, Nikki, of there's lots of people from all over the world on this call. So please do feel free to chip in um, in the chat or in the answers and to, to, to share experience or to, to, to share suggestions. Um, <clears throat> I'll just mention two, two um, examples of things um, from uh, reported uh, and, and personal experience. So, um, there's a really interesting system uh, that's used in parts of India called Lokadalat, um, where uh, mediation um, is done in front of the, the public. So um, you have a, a panel, a three-person uh, panel uh, of, 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 of neutrals who sit together, and everybody in the context is free to pass by and to uh, watch, to listen, and so on. And that's been done in order that and everything that's reached, uh, any agreement that's reached that resolves the dispute is um, done so, um, and this is usually part of private public sector disputes as I understand it, everything that is discussed is dis discussed in public and therefore any outcome has been done completely transparently. And therefore the government, uh, lo usually lo lo local government stands on, is able to um, uh, settle situations without accusation of corruption because uh, of the public gaze not being taken away from that, which is a really fascinating example as it stands in complete and utter um, opposition to many of the Western ideas about what mediation actually is. But I think it just speaks to, to, to one of those points. I think one of the other things in some of the contexts that I've worked in, um, in um, uh, where, where governments... Um, uh, very definitely don't reflect um, practice in, uh, let's say, Western Europe, is that even in those contexts, they do have pressure points and they do have concerns and difficulties in dealing with situations. So this speaks to a more general point around dealing with chronic underlying conflict situations, which cause even authoritarian um, organizations a huge headache. So have you analyzed the situation, speaking to Sheila's point, adequately enough to work out what those pressure points are? Um, and have you worked out what, uh, where, without selling your soul, you can actually do things to change the situation, which may make a big difference for people uh, involved in the situation? Um, and uh, I think that 
that's a that's a um uh things like as i would understand it the the change in the ecuadorian legislation that didn't come about by magic by somebody in government going oh i've woken up with an amazing dream and this is it that it, it comes about through a, a, a lot of um hard work and thinking on everybody's part so but i hand over to to um sheila to uh, or to michael for further comments yeah just thinking about ecuador i was reminded um many years ago now i was uh, actually at a, a seminar on uh, dispute resolution and mediation and the president of ecuador was actually present and he spoke about uh, a dispute that he was you know that was involved with a neighboring country and and actually he was using the skills of mediation and um that was that happened you know 20 25 years ago this incident and yet you know finally eventually over time um the law gets gets changed now hopefully um one of the upsides of um of um the chronic situation we find ourselves in is that things are going to speed up um that i think and that's 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 something that that perhaps we should try and piggyback on is, is to actually push for speed take time where you need to to really understand the issues uh, and find processes that are flexible um and and a, a mindset that can 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 get people to be more collaborative um i find it fascinating you know michael's facilitated conversation there what it produced you know it probably just looks like well that's that's common sense isn't it why don't people do that all the time i, I and i was added one on, on governments though i think it's with be careful not to overly generalize governments are all different right everyone and, and i think there's a loose general rule of the thumb that the more transparent rule of law that you find, the more openness you find towards um, negotiating and finding solutions and efficient resolutions of disputes, the more you find high levels of corruption, oddly enough, the more you find rigidity. Um, because in an environment where people are very, there's a reputation for being corrupt, then people say, well, I'm not going to settle because, again, as I said earlier, if I settle with you, then I may be accused of corruption. And I actually repeated this to a colleague one time when negotiating in a certain country. And my colleague who was from the country said, oh, well, that was that was the invitation to pay a bribe. In other words, when they tell you, if I settle this case, I'm going to be accused of uh, I could in two years, this was told to me in one case, you know, two years, they could open up an investigation on corruption. So that's an invitation to pay the bribe, which I was so naive at the time that I didn't see that as that um, wouldn't, of course, gone down that. But I, I was, was <laughs> so trained not to go down that path that I didn't even see it coming. But I think that the, you, you find that in those cases, yeah, it, it's, it's one thing I, I put into the chat here that can help if it's an international dispute, is to involve the embassy of one of the <clears throat> claiming parties. And I've been in situations where an ambassador to a these are larger disputes, but it doesn't have to be the ambassador of a country will come with you to negotiate with government officials or will advise you on how to negotiate with government officials in a transparent, ethical, um, correct way. And sometimes you can make progress, but you know, if you're dealing with a place that's got endemic corruption and the only way to get government people to do anything is by paying a bribe, well then you just maybe just shouldn't be working. I hate to say it, but that's just, there's nothing you can do. And I should uh, at this moment um, say a particular thank you to, to Leila, who is, is clarifying some of the elements of, of Loka Dala. I think it, 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 it mm -hmm. highlights some of the um, differences in the way that different the same dispute resolution process will be uh, perceived or characterized um, in terms of, of the, the third party role very effectively. Um, so I think um, coming back to this, this question, uh, what I'm hearing a lot of is this underlying work in the background to set up flexible conflict management processes in terms of how contracts are set up how things are dealt with in an ongoing process so that when disputes happen, sort of acute situations arise, there's the flexibility and the structure behind it to be able to manage that more effectively. Um, agree with me, disagree with me. I, 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 have I, have I, am I learning? Yeah, agree. 
that was definitely a theme, um, and I think it tied in with that is is all of the all of the unique tools uh, that are at the disposal of the dispute resolution community, and also a broader conception of who we are. And I just popped into the chat uh, an article on the Ecuadorian um, mediation. Um, by Jimena Bustamante, who's going to be one of our speakers, as Isabel said, and just uh, another resource is, um, uh, she was also a, um, a, a Weinstein Jams Fellow, which is a fellowship and a scholarship that uh, accepts um, dispute resolution um, practitioners from all around the world to exactly do the kind of thing that we're doing here, learn and share and have access to resources to help answer uh, these, these complex, difficult questions, both in times of crisis and, and throughout uh, time to, to figure out better ways to, to solve and resolve and prevent uh, and, and really do the work that, that Michael and Sheila have, have been speaking about. I think I have another uh, a, a question here to, to Sheila and Michael. And one of the things that I've been observing, because I've been in, involved in a consultation with, with the UK government, and one of the things that I've I've seen there is a, a level of skill from some of the public sector terms in drawing out consultation and facilitating um, questions and dialogue from the private sector in order to try and pre-resolve issues before coming to a government recommendation or a government position. Um, and I think that's something that's 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 quite interesting because it's again an element that we don't we don't see necessarily um, or think about, particularly if we're primarily in the private sector. How do we interact with uh, with government on, and, and what else goes on there? Um, uh, and I suppose there's a, a, a transferable issue there in terms of what that therefore asks, interestingly, in the context that I've um, experienced in the moment, asks um, ADR providers to actually talk and work together on something, which, of course, is um, an interesting proposition because we do it to other people. We don't do it on ourselves as the... Um, it is, of course, the satir satirical position. So what what do we suggest or, or what, what learning is there in that sort of environment um, of getting either private sector, whether that's ADR providers working together to encourage changes that we want to see, or in terms of enabling government to, to actually um, work through things? Yeah, um, I've been involved um with the agriculture sector quite a lot um, in terms of particularly related to supply chain web and human rights problems in the supply web and how you mitigate against that and how you handle it. Um, and what's very interesting is that, you know, in agriculture, it's very practical, it's on the ground. So you've got crops in the field, you need to get those crops picked, you need to get them sent wherever they need to get sent. They need to get processed, et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually a very operational uh, type of, 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 of business. Um, and what I found very interesting in my work um, in that area was that a lot of those people who are who are you know trading massive amounts of 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 of, of, of you know dollars of, of of business and who are interestingly enough interacting with great big entities, but the the suppliers for those great big ent entities end up being quite you know, can be quite small farmers at the end of the day. So um, what I have found is that they were the, the, the people at the, you know, selling to the selling to the retail market, if you will, um, actually feel quite removed from from lawmakers and um, see that as very much removed from their day to day. And so a lot of the time, I think that they're doing their own problem solving um, and they, I think, really seek to influence um, from an industry perspective. And I think that that's the use of, of um, you know, associations coming together. And there's a reason why you have lobbying and policy groups. Um, and I think that that can actually be very, um, very effective. It's, for example, you know, if you, if you take away um, the right for seasonal worker visas, how are you going to get workers? What will that mean? Um, so there's a great principle that's being upheld here, but the net result means that actually food rots in the fields. Um, people who could be employed are not employed. People who might have been employed are now um, exploited and become even more vulnerable. So 
my experience is that they they often get together in a oftentimes in a very practical way. And what I observed certainly in agriculture was that oftentimes people felt quite dislocated, and that that came up with them. You know, the thoughts of going to 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 be at a parliament um, inquiry or provide advice seemed extraordinary to them um, because not enough of that necessarily is is happening. So I think encouraging um, that link between, you know, governments, public sector and the private sector would be massively, massively um, helpful. Um, and where it happens, I think it is effective. And I think that they do, they do influence. We often see that in a negative way, but there are practical things that they really can, um, they really can influence for the better. Thank you, you know. I Michael. could take, if you want, the, the Veramani has an interesting question there on government inflexibility. It's actually something I feel prepared to discuss. I can, add, I can give my response to that, which he asks about what do you do in situations where the government is basically inflexible and has lawyers who say, take it or leave it. These are the contract terms, governing law, dispute resolution, et cetera. So there are clearly two situations where you see this, right? One is where you have to accept terms and conditions as in order to participate in an award, right? You've already accepted them and they're not negotiable. So, but that doesn't seem to be this case because you're talking to the lawyers. That's the second case, which is where you win a bid and then you're allowed to go in and make amendments and negotiate terms and conditions, right? So presumably the other side does have authority to negotiate because they're talking to you here, right? And so now just a shout out, I actually did an exercise book called Negotiating International Commercial Contracts. <laughs> But I, but I included an exercise on this, which because it was a constant irritation for me in my life as an in-house counsel, because we always faced this situation and it was, well, well, no, if you can, no in the sense of push back on this, but if you can, turn these to your advantage. If they're non-negotiable on dispute resolution or governing law, and often government entities are inflexible because they've got political other reasons where they say, you know, we're in the state of X, we have to use X law. Okay, so they're not going to negotiate that. But that leaves you other things to negotiate, right? What can you trade? I'm accepting your inflexibility on dispute resolution, but that's higher risk for me. Give me more money, right? So let's, or let's talk about delivery conditions, or let's talk about, you know, the payment terms instead of paying me 50% up front and 50% at the end of the contract, pay me 70% up front. And, and, you know, I mean, see, if it, you, it, it, often in an, if there is a negotiation and one side is being inflexible, I would just simply say, well, can you turn it around so you can use some of that inflexibility to your advantage? Because in effect, they're increasing your risk for, profile and you can tell them, well, I'm asking for more money. I'm asking for more price because you're, you're inflexible on governing law and dispute resolution. We don't have lawyers in your country. Thank my suggestions. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I'm just looking at Helen Jaljamshi's uh, um, question about the interpretation of, um, I assume you are referring not to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but rather business impact analysis um, in there, uh, in terms of sovereign state and the interpretation of it. Um, and if mediations use, can investors interpret the BIA treaty? Um, any comments to the panelists, from the panelists? Michael? Yeah, I, I'm not an investment uh, dispute person here, so I, I don't feel comfortable. It's unfortunate because I see people in the chat who are who I know really are <laughs> experts in this area. <laughs> so I know the answer exists, but I, would, I wouldn't claim to, to, to have it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> As we are, as we're um, pushing the end of our time, um, I hope that some some answers to some of the unanswered questions might continue in the chat in the next couple of minutes. Uh, Nikki, do you want to say anything before I wrap up? Uh, no, I just want to say thank you, and I, I love all of the questions. Although we don't have the answers to them, and I'm not sure uh, you know anybody has the answers because they're tough questions. But um, this is precisely the kind of exchange and um, and just open discussion that we we hope and encourage uh you know with, with this series of webinars that is going to continue so so thank you everybody for your engagement and your difficult questions and thank you to michael and sheila uh for your for your very thoughtful answers thank you um and i'd just like to to second um nikki's uh, uh thanks and 
Um, I was just thinking in terms of wrapping this up about two things. I think there's a space between the fatalism and determinism of I can't do anything in all these uh, crises and the optimism and, and constructivism of I can create the reality I wish for. Um, and I want to quote um, three people who, if you have um, studied in the socio-political context or the legal context, you may have heard of. So Kimail Oliver Ramsbottom and, and Tom Woodhouse. And um, this is a quote from a paper that they've just written about the current situation. So conflict resolution above all needs a strategy for facing the turbulence and unexpected fluctuations of human affairs. Perhaps the best image is a seagoing boat, a clipper, with a vast array of sails of all sizes and set at all angles to maximize chances of catching unpredictable winds. There may be calms when no movement is possible. There may be gales when sails have to be furled in, to ride out storms. There may be opposing headwinds or good fortune may bring prevailing winds. Unexpected gusts may swirl. But if sails are not continually raised in advance, no progress will be made no matter how many winds are blowing. Mm, brilliant. So with that thought, I leave you. Do sign up for the next in the series, which is going to be in early October. There'll be a deep dive on the contribution of mediation in acute disputes and underlying conflict. So um, maybe by then uh, I might have a helpful answer on the question of BIA. Um, uh, I'll, I'll write it down. It's homework for me. And um, I look forward to seeing you, as I say, hopefully um, in early October. The date is um, going to be available shortly. There'll be a transcript available shortly um, at the same time as uh, the recording of this going live. So apologies to one or two of you with um, maybe with hearing difficulties who would have liked to be able to follow it more closely. And for updates and information on future CRB and JAMS webinars, please see our web pages. Um, thank you for joining. See you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.